Hey, welcome to the Kingdoms Podcast. My name is Luke and I host this with my buddy Matt Ma. And our goal is to empower you to discover how your faith impacts culture for God's kingdom. To do that, we're sitting down with different men and women from all kinds of disciplines to uncover how they, through their ambitions and vocational skill set, make a difference in the lives of those around them. And so if this is helpful to you, we'd love it if you could like it, share it, and subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for this episode on the Kingdoms Podcast. Matt and I are so grateful to be here uh, with the author and speaker, Philip Yancey. Philip, thank you for joining us. It's going to be a pleasure, I'm sure. Thank you. Well, Philip, I'm, I'm somebody who has benefited tremendously from your writing, Matt, as well. And I know I speak for many listeners when I say that. And we're excited. I know uh, there's so many books you've written that you've contributed to. I believe it's over 15 million books have been sold and translated into something like, is it 40 languages? Is that right, Philip, around the world? Sounds about right, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, it just, it's just demonstrates that your writing resonates deeply with people. Don't ask me to name 40 languages, but that's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. Well, uh, Philip, maybe to start us off, we are excited to talk about your latest work, your, your memoir, Where the Light Fell. And a book that I learned a tremendous amount from and was also challenged, but also encouraged by in a lot of ways. And to lead off, we'd we'd love to know what was the most important reason for you for writing Where the Light Fell? It started out because I wanted to capture my subculture. Uh, Mine was unusual. It was in the South back in the 1950s. I was growing up, coming of age. It was a racist, angry, fundamentalist church, uh, pretty extreme, doctrinaire. We thought there was going to be a very small room in heaven and a very large room in hell. Mm. And I had read other books that captured the, say, the fundamentalist Mormon subculture or the Irish Catholic or the Orthodox Jewish. But it seems like whenever the media, New York Times or Time Magazine or McLean's magazine, whenever they cover evangelicals, they don't get it right. <laughs> they, they're tone deaf. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to capture a moment in time. That's what, That was my original idea in starting. And later mm-hmm. I realized I was actually writing the backstory to my own life. And I'm, I'm kind of glad I did it in this order. One by one, I've taken kind of the basics of the faith, what I was taught, and then how I changed and what I now understand them to be. So a book, The Jesus I Never Knew, this is the Jesus I did not know growing up, but I came to know mm-hmm. what's so amazing about grace. I didn't really experience much grace growing up, but then I did. Um, how I came to like the Old Testament, does prayer make any difference? I've spent 40 years now writing on those topics, just one by one. Mm-hmm. And I realized what I was doing was taking what I'd been handled, handed by the church I grew up in and looking at it, taking it apart, scrubbing off parts of it. What What's truth here? What should I keep and what should I discard? Mm. And that's what I've been doing for 40 years. All my books are pretty much the same style. They're they're first person, personal pilgrimage, I call them. They're idea-driven books. Mm. But this is different. This is the story behind the story. And frankly, it was as much a discovery for me, the writer, as it would be for any readers. Uh, There are a lot of stories I haven't told that you didn't know about me evidently until you read read this book because I, I haven't written about them. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of put my life together. I felt now was the time to uh, just be open and explore my own experience and see how it relates to what I produced out of that experience, the, the whole shelf full of books that I've been working on all those years. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, the thing that surprised me, Matt and Luke, is that the stuff I experienced in the 60s, I thought we had gotten past that. I thought that's what the 60s were all about. Yeah. yeah. But man, if you look at the newspapers today, it's, it's not that different. You've got yeah. you know, racism is, is right in the front page, uh, protests in the street, divisions, uh, politicization of, of churching mm. and, and uh, politics. And... So for one thing, I wanted to look back and see if we can learn something. And, and if not, why didn't we learn something back then that mm. should inform what we're going through now? Mm. 
And I love that you bring us there because uh, your story in as much as it is very personal is also so connected to all of our lives. And uh, many people today uh, go through what's sort of often called a process of deconstruction where they're taking, uh, like you did, that whatever their church is teaching them, and they come to a decision of uh, what do I keep and what do I get rid of? And oftentimes, uh, it's faith altogether. It's Christianity yeah, altogether. It's How did you instead find that middle ground where you found that gen uh, genuine appreciation of the gospel message that your church proclaimed, while also honestly acknowledging the dysfunction that you encountered? You're right. I, I get confused when I read these articles about deconstructing. It sounds pretty complicated to me, but I, <laughs> I like the pattern that uh, Richard Rohr sets out. I don't know if you know that name, R-O-H-R. Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, we naturally go through a period of ordering and mm -hmm. then disordering and reordering. Mm -hmm. So you, you start out with order. And usually for most of us, if you're raised in a church environment or any environment, you kind of pick up what your parents say, what your teachers say. They say, this is the way it is, and you believe that. And, and then you become a teenager and then a college student, and you start thinking, wait a minute, this, this sounds different. This looks different than what I was taught. And so you often go through a period of suspension where you're just not sure what you believe. You're holding it at a, at a distance. And then later, when you're maybe a parent yourself, you start thinking, well, I, I need to make some decisions here. What am I going to teach my kids? Mm -hmm. And you go through a, a reordering process. And that's healthy and that's normal. And I encourage parents, especially as they watch their kids, you know, give them some space, give them some time. You're very limited in what you, once you get past teenage, or uh, once your kids are past teenagehood, you're very limited in the control you have over them. You'll find that out rather quickly, but you can be supportive and caring and pray. And in my case, and I would recommend this, I was blessed, I, I like to say, I experienced some of the worst that the church has to offer in the growing up years and some of the best that the church has to offer since then. I found a grace-filled church in Chicago that was very involved in the city, very involved in social problems, social issues. And um, I also found some mentors. There's a, an author here, I don't know if you know him, David Brooks, who writes for the mm. New York Times. And he wrote a book called The Road to Character. Mm. And he yes. said, he said, keep in mind, there are two kinds of virtues. He calls one resume virtues mm. and one eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are what we are encouraged to spend our life accumulating. What school we went to, how much money we make, how high we rise in the corporate world or the military world or whatever your world is. And you know that, that's where a lot of us spend our energy trying to achieve, achieve, achieve. The funny thing is, he says, when you're dead and people are giving a eulogy, they never talk about he owned 1200 shares of Microsoft stock or he drove yeah. a Tesla or, you know, they never talk about that. They talk about he was kind. She was compassionate. He was caring. She cared for her family above all. Uh, yeah. He loved God. He cared for his neighbors. And I would just encourage people, especially as you're facing some of those, what kind of person do I want to be? to choose some people, I'd like to be like that person. And I, I, there's a good chance that you'll find somebody who's strong on the eulogy virtues more mm. than even the resume virtues. And I, mm. I happen to find uh, a person who is good at both, <laughs> both sets of virtues. Uh, I didn't have a father. I, my book starts out telling me about my father's death. Well, I was just mm. a year old, so I, I didn't know him at all. And then as a young writer, the very first book I wrote was a book called Where is God When It Hurts? Hmm. In the process of writing that, I came across Dr. Paul Brand, who was a, a British scientist. He was in his 60s. I'm in my 20s. I mean, we didn't have a lot in common, but he, he became kind of a, a surrogate father for me. Hmm. And I followed him around. I wrote about his faith. We wrote three books together, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, In His Image, and uh, The Gift of Pain. And I learned from him. And it, during that period of time, I wouldn't have been able to write about my own faith. I was still in that disordered phase. Mm -hmm. But I could write with great integrity about his. And gradually, 
that's the kind of person I wanted to be like. And I had an up close example. I could ask him any question. I could travel with him. I could see him inside the operating room. I could really understand how, how a person who follows Jesus, how their life is different. And it really only takes one person like that. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, there are billionaires that you could go after. From what I can tell, most of them are kind of jerks. <laughs> And, and there are sports stars, some of them are worth emulating, some of them are not. But I would encourage people going through that searching period to find people that you want to be like when you're their age. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then study them, if you can, try to get close to them, learn from them directly. And, and just put yourself on a trajectory early on. This is the kind of person I want to be, not the things I want to accomplish. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, that's so well said, so well said. You know, Philip, to, to circle back to where the light fell, as I was reading it, I was thinking about the fact that in, in Western culture today, you know, it's not uncommon to learn of an individual or an organization that's that's charged with racist action towards mm -hmm. towards others or someone else. And, and almost simultaneously, you see this kind of seismic shift as other organizations and individuals try and distance themselves and, and almost this attempt of exoneration, if you will. Yeah. And as I, as I was reading through where the light fell, I realized like you're so honest about racism that existed in, in some of the cultures of different faith communities you're a part of as a youth. And instead of trying to say, well, that was them, but that's not me. Try, instead of trying to exonerate yourself, uh, you actually speak of seeking out individuals uh, like the, the family of Dr. Tony Evans, for example, who uh, were negatively impacted by these faith communities that, that you were a part of with the desire to say, how can I make amends? And mm -hmm. I found myself asking, Philip, how did you have the, the courage to do that? And even with that, what do you think the reputation of Jesus followers in the world would be if we embraced and acted on that same kind of courage? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, and one thing that I see different now than what was going on back then was that the whole civil rights movement was led under moral leadership. Most mm. of the most of the leaders were clergymen, John Lewis mm. and Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy, uh, Jesse Jackson, Stokely Carmichael. They're all they're all clergymen trained mm. in seminaries and Martin Luther King being right at the top. Mm. And King made this strong distinction. He said, he said, we can pass laws to keep white people from lynching black people but we can't pass a law getting them to love mm -hmm. each other. But he said, that's my ultimate goal. And I will, I will love white people even when they're a policeman beating me with a nightstick. I've got to do that because the goal is, is not just to change laws, it's to change hearts. Mm. And I don't see that so much today. I see, I see opposite sides on on uh, a picket line, just screaming at each other, calling each other names, mm. uh, sometimes actually breaking out in violence against each other. And I don't see anyone saying the goal is reconciliation. The goal is the beloved community. The, the mm. goal is that we love each other. Yeah. And I, I think we've lost a lot. And it, I don't have a lot of a lot of hope, frankly, unless some moral sources arise, some moral authorities that can call us back. And I, it, it's astonishing to me. I wrote a book on what's amazing about grace. And it's amazing to me what happens when someone actually stands up and admits wrong and repents and asks forgiveness and coming together. We saw that in mm. South Africa dramatically. Yes. And I know you in Africa are going, excuse me, you in Canada are going through that with the First Nations issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish we in America took a similar approach of, of true repentance first, it, it immediately devolves into reparations, you know, how much money you owe us or, but I think so often the wronged people primarily want to hear, I was wronged, <laughs> you hurt me, at least say that you're sorry, mm. instead of defending yourself. Mm. So my church was, was egregious in its treatment. You mentioned Tony Evans, and I tell the story in the book how when the civil rights movement was just getting underway, my church 
actually printed up little cards to give to any African American who tried to come in saying, you're not welcome here. We know you're a troublemaker. You're not really a child of God. Uh, we don't want you. If you want to know more about Jesus, call this number. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and they wouldn't allow them in the building. Well, after a while, they softened a little bit and they allowed some African American students from a from a college called Carver Bible Institute, all black college in Atlanta, to attend the service. And one of them uh, liked the preaching a lot and he applied for membership. And this mm. became a very heated open meeting in the church with a people shouting and the like gavel pounding and all that. And ultimately the deacons decided unanimously to reject him as a member of the church. And that turned out to be Tony Evans, who now has a great ministry in Dallas with a 10,000 people in his church. Yeah. And I, I was on the wrong side. You know, I was in that order phase where you believe everything that the adults tell you. And one of the big crises of faith for me was when I realized how wrong the church was. Mm -hmm. They had told me uh, about the limitations, black people can never rise to a certain level. And then I ended up with a PhD boss in biochemistry at this elite uh, campus. And I realized the church had misled me. Mm -hmm. And, and when, you, when you put your foot in the ground uh, on heresy as my church did, and then somebody discovers that it's wrong, I felt a feeling of betrayal. Well, if they were wrong about that, maybe they were wrong about Bible, maybe they were wrong about Jesus. And it was a huge crisis of faith. It took me a long time to overcome. So I, I needed to repent. It, it, uh, it wasn't easy to go back to some of these people that I had been on the other side with, but I found them to a person to be gracious and understanding and, and forgiving. It, was, it was, ended up being a very sweet time with shed tears on both sides. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. It's amazing to think of uh, how, how repentance can really form that grace-filled community uh, that we need so much today. Uh, as you reflect on sort of where the church is at today and where our world is at in, in a more sort of like holistic view, um, I wonder, in your college studies, uh, you wrote sort of about the, the campus atmosphere and, and you said something along the lines of, if Jesus showed up on campus, I wonder what would the administration do with him? Would he too get shot down for questioning his teachers? And uh, I noticed uh, a few quotes by Russian uh, literature, Russian mm -hmm. authors, and it drove my mind to Dostoevsky and uh, sort of this, this same similar question of like, if Jesus showed up today, uh, in our day, in our movements and our traditions, uh, how do you think people would respond to him? What questions do you think he might ask us? Hmm. Yeah, that, you're referring to the scene from Brothers Karamazov, where I am, yes, uh, yeah. the Catholic priest puts him in prison. And he knows who he is, recognizes him, but sees him as a dangerous force. And he is a dangerous force. He's dangerous to the church. And one of the things uh, that brought helped bring me back to faith, at least made me open to it, was when I got to know Jesus himself in the Gospels, because I was in a fairly controlling environment in this Bible college. You know, you don't question, you just behave the way they tell you to, and you don't certainly don't do anything that might um, rattle the teachers. Uh, it was kind of a propaganda dispensing institution mm -hmm. and, and a lot of pressure to conform. And I started reading the Gospels. That was, that was my assignment. And Jesus wasn't like that at all. Jesus never twisted anyone's arm. There's the story of the rich, rich young ruler who came to him and said, what do I have to do? Well, you know, keep the law. I do that. Well, then give away all your money. Oh, uh, never mind. And, and I think it's Mark, he, he walks away and says, and Jesus loved him. Hmm. And I, I imagine now, what would we do? We'd say, well, uh, how about if you start with maybe 10%, maybe if you start with 10%, you can grow spiritually over time. You know, but Jesus would never, he wasn't like these revival evangelists that I was raised under who would sing one more chorus of just as I am and plead with the people to come hmm. forward and, you know, play on their emotions. And they're masters of doing that. And Jesus was so the opposite of that. In fact, uh, 
in John 6, he made it as hard as possible. And it, even his own disciples, the, the crowds just melted away. And his own disciples didn't know where to go. And Jesus said, well, are, are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, well, where, where else can we go? Mm. Kind of plaintively, we, you're the last option to Jesus. Mm. <laughs> you know, we don't know where, where else. And, and I, I love that, that aspect of God, that, that God isn't that controlling demagogue who's trying to get little puppets down here. God is, is a lover who's trying to woo people to love in return. Mm. And it's for our best, and God knows that. But he, he understands the difference between love and power. Mm. It's, uh, it's vulnerable to write candidly about your faith community, but it's exceptionally vulnerable to write candidly about your own family. And so yeah. I think of some of our listeners who, who like you, maybe long to tell their story, uh, this journey of, of taking things apart and putting them back together, of, of, of entering into God's grace. And they don't know how to, to, to share everything, to include the good and the bad about their faith communities and families. Um, what would be your encouragement to them on that front? That's one of the main things I've learned about memoirs. When I first decided to write one, I'd never written a memoir before. So I started reading a whole bunch of them, several hundred actually. Every night I'd read another memoir. And I thought that you would read a memoir to learn about the person who's writing it. Mm. And then eventually I came to see, no, you actually read to learn about yourself. <laughs> mm. Because every, every single book I read, there was a memoir, no matter how poorly written they were, but everyone struck a, a memory that had long been buried inside me. And I wouldn't have recovered that memory if I hadn't read that particular book. And, I, and that's what I hope uh, this book does for other people. I'm, I'm giving a pattern of, of somebody who grew up in a dysfunctional church, very dysfunctional, I think anyone would agree, pretty dysfunctional family, I think any, anyone would agree. And and, and endured a number of wounds from both of those and, and had to go through a recovery process and met the grace of God along the way. And, and I know most of the readers of this book believe that they came from a dysfunctional family, dysfunctional church. It's just mm -hmm. we're broken people and we do absorb these wounds, some to more degrees than others. And I, I didn't intentionally set out to set a pattern. I just set out to tell my story, but later, mm -hmm. When it was together, I saw, well, once I, I likened it to uh, trying to put together a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, but there's no cover on the box. So mm -hmm. no pictures. So I don't know where I'm going. I'm just going by little shapes and I don't see how what, what it's going to look like until it's all put together. And then I say, oh, well, that's, that's me. <laughs> but I didn't really know that as I was putting the pieces together. And I, and I think, that's the way perhaps a memoir can be helpful that that you can in the process bring to the surface the own pe your own pieces of the puzzle mm. and see how they can fit together and mm. and at the end i i have to look back and i i did say this in the book at the very end i said nothing got wasted mm. would would it have been better if this had not happened well probably yes but it did happen and it's part of who i am now and I really, I don't live with any lasting regrets. Oh, if only this had been different. Now, that's not true of everybody. I tell the story of my brother who didn't survive intact. He went the other direction, just mm. trying to find a whole new picture on the box mm. and to be as different from that church and that family as he could possibly be. And along the way, often when you're reacting like that, you make self-destructive choices. And he certainly did and, mm. and paid the penalty for that. And I... That story's not over. My brother is still changing and softening. And even in my own family story, because I waited a long time to tell it, knowing I, I could affect what <laughs> people who are close to me. But even since I turned in the manuscript of the book, there have been some advances toward reconciliation between my mother mm -hmm. and brother, who still haven't seen each other in 51 years, but they've had contact now for the wow. first time in all that period. Wow. Now, as you're talking about all of these different puzzle pieces that kind of come together, uh, for some of us, as we walk in our journey of discipleship to Jesus, significant part of those puzzle pieces are our families, uh, those mm. who are, you know, in that circle, who are nurturing us and encouraging us towards uh, Christ for others of us. 
Uh, the church provides that spiritual family that really leads and guides us. Uh, you've already mentioned some of them, but uh, could you elaborate on maybe some of your spiritual family members in your life who had a profound impact on your spiritual formation? Sure. The very first job, actually the only job as an adult I've had, was with Campus Life magazine, which was a teenage magazine associated with Youth of Christ here. And it had a, had a very wise and gentle editor. Uh, and he told me about writing, but he also told me about being a man, being a human. Hmm. Uh, I joke with him now because he would call me in as a young writer. And I had the idea, you, you just write whatever comes to your mind and then you turn it in and they publish it. And uh, that's not the way it works. <laughs> so I would turn in my article and he would call me in and say, well, Philip, this is about 80% of the way there. And I learned what, the, what he was really saying was, tear it up, start all over. <laughs> you know? But he would, never, he would never say that. He'd always have, have an encouraging way to put it. Now, you're about 80% mm. of the way there. And it, it wasn't really true, but I kind of needed that mm. gentle letdown, you know? Mm. And he was, a, he was a great person of prayer. He would take these long walks. The office was right by the prayer, what we called the prairie path, which was an old railroad track that had been made into a bicycle path and uh, would go out during the lunch hour for an hour in prayer. Dr. Paul Brand was was uh, the most impactful for me because I spent so much time with him, almost 10 mm -hmm. years. And then uh, a healthy church. And I know some people are listening and uh, they may be in a community where it's just really hard to find a healthy church, mm -hmm. especially in Canada, you reprobates up there, but... <laughs> <laughs> We'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there are a lot more uh, church going people in the United States than there are in yeah. Canada. Mm. And, uh, but we're, we're trying to catch up to you very quickly, actually, yeah. on the statistics. It's sad to see. It's true. Yeah. But I would say that I've been in one really healthy church uh, that was not only emotionally healthy, but doctrinally healthy and in mm. a balanced way. And most of the others, one would have good sermon content, but lousy music, and one would have good community, but lousy sermons, you know, it's hard to find a church that does everything well. Mm -hmm. And for those people, I learned, it, it, church is not, it, it's not like a shopping center where you try on this pair of shoes here, and then you go down the the mall and try on a different pair of shoes and you know compare prices and things like that. It's sadly, people do that. Mm -hmm. But it, but a church is like a family. I decided like a dysfunctional family. Mm -hmm. We we all have um, family members who seem strange, who who don't follow the script, who push the edges. But I mean, you guys have a Thanksgiving holiday as as we do, don't you? Yes, yeah. it's just a different yes. day. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, Yet we get together on holidays, and when when one of the family members has cancer, somehow the family rallies around, and we we know we're, there's a tie greater than just self interest that holds us together. Mm -hmm. And I think we should approach church in the same way too, not as something that's going to meet all my needs, but as something that I can learn from and also contribute to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you end up being contributing more than learning, you know, gaining, mm. but that's okay because the church needs healthy people too. Mm. So um, what, what worries me, what bothers me, especially when I talk to younger people, this, this happens a lot. Uh, I'll be sitting next to a person, say on an airplane or in a, in a lounge somewhere. And uh, they say, you know, what do you do? I'm a writer. What do you write? I write Christian books about this and that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I used to be a church person. What happened? And then they tell me this story. And I just smile and say, oh, it's a lot worse than that. Let me tell you my story. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, wait a minute, I thought you were a Christian writer. They say, well, yeah, I yeah. am. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty bad trade. Mm. Yeah. If, you, if you decide, I'm going to cut off all contact with the God of the universe who created me because mm. of the way I was treated in church or my mother was treated in church or something. That's a bad trade. And mm. I guess that's, that's the message that I really wanted to get across that, yeah, bad things happen and, and bad Christians happen too. Yeah. 
and and I endured that. But the ultimate goal is is not to compare myself to them or go through life angry at them. It was to get past that and find out what is worth keeping. And and a relationship with God, the God who made you, the God who loves you. I can't think of anything more important. And to trade that for any for any reason, is, I think, is a bad trade. Yeah. Wow. Well said. Really well said. You know, Philip, you... You talk about obviously uh i think some of the two greatest themes of your life being suffering and grace and, and mm. to touch on grace specifically you write about encountering god's grace uh, in nature uh, in music uh, but also in romance and i wonder mm. could you could you unpack how engaging with those realities really started to to shape your life and and almost breathe a newness into your life if that makes sense sure yeah the title of the book as you mentioned is where the light fell Hmm. And that's taken from a quote by St. Augustine, who said, I couldn't look at the sun directly, hmm. but I could look on where, this, where the light fell from the sun and gradually followed the rays back to, the, to their source. And that's truly my story, because as I explained in the book, I was living in a total, we well, are Baptist, total immersion, total saturation environment with religion. In fact, I spent high school years living in this little mobile home. We were very poor a trailer on the grounds of the church. I could never get away. Every hmm. time the door was open, then they'd have revival tents and they have vacation Bible school and summer camp. I was just constantly berated by the gospel message. Go, you're going to hell if you don't. Hmm. And I, um, I came away. The church did a number of things wrong. I, I think the worst thing they, they did was give me this image of God that a lot of people have of this glowering, uh, killjoy bully up in the sky who's just looking for somebody who might be enjoying themselves so he can squash them, break them. And I mean, it was that overt in the church I grew up in and we lived in fear all the time, fear and guilt and shame. And so the only way I knew how to survive that plus the family stuff going on was to build a, a shell around myself so that nobody could get to me. And I did, you know, I tried to prove there's no such thing as cold or heat or good smell, bad smell. I tried to conquer pain. And a lot of people who are in families like that, you know, self-harm, they do that. And it, it's a way of, it's a way of controlling the little bit of control you have, you know, your mm -hmm. own body. And so I went through that too. And then I ended up on, on a Bible college campus of, of all places. And again, the shell hardened. So I, took great delight in scandalizing people by sitting out in the patio reading Why I'm Not a Christian by Bertrand Russell and mm. books like that. And, you know, I was kind of a jerk in a lot of ways, known as the campus uh, heretic, apostate. And I like that. Um, mm. There's that shell again, you know, they're not going to get to me. And I expected there was a little part of me carried over from childhood that expected God to break that shell, to crack it, to smash me, because mm. that's the image of God that I had. Well, that's not God. God, mm. uh, God doesn't do that. God, God is a lover. God woos. God brings. And those were the rays of light uh, that softened me, softened me up. Um, mm. Nature had always been my refuge when things got bad in the family. I'd just go take a walk with a butterfly net or you know a hammer to dig up beetles out of an old decaying log or something nature is just full of amazement and wonder and it just went on whether anybody watched it or not you know and i became one of the watchers i wanted to be a scientist growing up an entomologist and then um, uh, music i had a brother who was preternaturally talented in music and I was not, but I, I appreciated it and, and fumbled around a little bit on the piano and, and violin myself. And then uh, romantic love was, was kind of the final chink in armor that was removed from me. You can see how God did the opposite of this kind of crashing and, and breaking, rather the dismantling that shell piece by piece. And, and But there was one piece missing and that was for me, growing up in that environment, how can I tell the real from the fake? I mm -hmm. had gone forward so many times to accept Jesus as my personal savior, prayed the sinner's prayer, gave testimonies. And 
I did. I didn't know how to tell the real from the fake because I knew how to fake it so well. And uh, I tell the, the story of my conversion, which I've not told in detail because when, whenever you do that in print, then a lot of people think, oh, well, I didn't have one of those. And you're right. God deals with all of us differently. But I think God knew I needed something that didn't come from me. I needed something that took me by surprise, that was unexpected and even at the time unsought. And so God did meet me in a, in a, in a very dramatic way that changed my life forever from that moment on. I mean, everything changed from that moment on. I had a lot of growing to do. I had a lot of changing to do, but I never really doubted the reality of God or the reality of the nature of God as a God of goodness and love and, and grace. I, you know, I think Jesus capsulized the entire story of human history and certainly the entire story of the, of the Bible in his parable of the prodigal son. There's the image of God standing on the porch every day, looking out, scanning the horizon. Could today be the day could today be the day that my my disobedient worthless son comes home i i, I want to have a feast i want to have a party that's that's the story of the gospel the good news and somehow we we twist it into what sounds like bad news to a lot of people but it's good news at the core yeah. that's beautiful i read recently and i can't let you know from where so i apologize but uh they they sort of said something along the lines that the uh, parable of the prodigal son should really be called the parable of the waiting God, the waiting mm -hmm. father. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is just such a, a beautiful image, as you say, that that whole time, really, what should be on our minds is is the waiting father who's who's waiting there ready to receive. So thank yeah. you for that. that. That's great. Now, uh, we're, we're coming into the end but I have a doozy of a quote that I want to read for you. Uh, okay. Because it's Luke's it, fault. <laughs> I was like, we got to read this quote, Matt. <laughs> he ran into my office book in hand and he, he read it for me. And I was oh. like, oh yeah, that is fantastic. I didn't so we're cry, gonna read it, but my eyes sweat a little bit. You okay. maybe cried a little <laughs> yeah. bit. It's good. So <laughs> it's good. Um, we're, we're hyping this up a lot, uh, but I am going to read it at length uh, because truly I, I, I do think that it provokes really um, just this mystery of grace mm. that if we're to receive grace uh it it really poses a, a a question because it is a mystery so uh without further ado you okay. write in the end my resurrection of belief had little to do with logic or effort and everything to do with the unfathomable mystery of god the apostle paul bowed before that mystery why was he, a self-described chief of sinners, chosen to proclaim the message that he had sworn to eradicate? Why was conniving Jacob chosen and his brother Esau rejected? Paul has no answer other than to quote God's own words. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I wince whenever I read those words, for I think of my brother who pursued God even as I did the opposite. I think of my father, a man far more devout than I, wholly committed to a life of service to God, who died before his 24th birthday. Like Paul, like Jake, like Job, I cannot begin to answer for God. I can only accept the free gift of grace with open hands. Uh, as we reflect on that, heavy, serious, uh, how do you embrace this mystery of grace while also navigating the tension of that mystery maybe even grief and confusion at times over God's grace in your life and simultaneously longing for others to encounter that grace in a life-changing way. Yeah. Well, we can't solve the mystery. That's for sure. sure. Yeah. And I, I guess I go back to Henry now and good Canadian hmm. who said um, that grace is a free gift of God. You know, some, sometimes people will say to me, wait a minute, what about Bonhoeffer's cheap grace? Maybe you're preaching cheap grace. And I say, grace isn't cheap. Grace isn't expensive. Grace is free. <laughs> you know, hmm. it's, it's a free gift. And the point is, you can't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to prove that you're worthy. We're all unworthy. The Bible is clear about that. All you can do with a gift is, is receive it with open hands. And so much of religiosity is about 
proving how good I am. Look at Jesus in the Pharisees. They were the closest to Jesus morally and doctrinally in other ways of any group there, but yet he was the hardest on them because it's so easy to think, oh, I, I've done it, you know, I've made it, I'm, I'm better than those people there. And, and when you do that, your hands get closed tight in a fist. And when your hands are closed tight in a fist and somebody offers you a gift, what happens? It, it drops to the ground. Mm. You don't get it. It's only people who have open hands. And I, I guess for those who, who haven't really experienced it, um, to me, the most important thing is to make sure your hands are open. People who, who are aware of their deep need already are pretty close to having open hands. You go to 12 hmm. step groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's the first, you got to have open hands. You, you don't, you can't say, well, okay, I have a little problem with alcohol, but that guy over there is a drug addict. No, I have a problem with alcohol. I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm not making it on my own. I need help. I need a higher, higher power. Hmm. And so many of the people who are reacting against a church background, for example, you know, they're, it's easy to, I, I thought myself so morally superior to those people. They were racists. You know, I looked down on racists. And, and um, in, in those days, I looked down on African-Americans. Now I look down on racists. And it's easy to just substitute one ranking thing over another. I'm better than. And, and I just go back to the open hands. Mm -hmm. Every day, I just ask God, I, I need these open hands. And it, it doesn't happen all at once. I, I told you about the softening through the music and nature and, and romantic love. And, and I tried praying a few times and, and nothing happened. And I, I couldn't tell what was real and what was fake. And then finally, I kind of gave up. But I still had those open hands because I believed in a different God than I had been raised with. And at some point in the mystery of grace, God saw fit to reveal himself in a very direct way. And that's all we can do. We, we can just say, I can't do it on my own, God. I need you. I need your help. And in different ways, and usually surprising ways, we can't control the time. That's the whole point. It's, it's God's grace. It's God's free gift. And like he said, you know, in, the, in that story, I, I'll have mercy and I'll have mercy. Jesus told the parable of the, uh, of the, the worker who was forgiven this huge debt, say a million dollars, something that no worker could possibly ever accumulate. It, it was a hyperbolic par parable. And then uh, he told another story of the people who started working early in the morning, and then the people who started working at five o'clock in the afternoon. And at the end of the day, the employer paid them the same amount. And the people who started at eight o'clock were not very happy. Wait a minute, we've been sweating out here all day and this guy gets the same amount of money I do. And what did Jesus say? It, very much what you said. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. He didn't, he didn't say I'll have judgment on whom I'll have judgment. He said, he said, you can't put bounds on my grace. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give it to the people, to the thief on the cross who had like two hours as a Christian for his entire life. He gets the same reward as Billy Graham. Well, that's not yeah. fair. Yeah, that's not fair. That's what grace is. Yeah. You, you can't calculate it. It's just there. It's beautiful. This is such a rich point to, to end on. And thank you for sharing those, those insights, Philip. You know, uh, I've read the book, Matt's read the book. Uh, we've read a lot of your books and, and would advocate for every single one of them, but especially for getting a copy of Where the Light Fell or for listeners who are saying, you know, we'd love to engage with Philip online. What's the best way for people to learn more about you and more about your writing? Well, first, I apologize on the price you have to pay for books in Can Canadian dollars. <laughs> I remember a time when it was the other way around, and now you guys, it, it gets bumped up. But uh, the best way to keep on top of me is uh, either a website, which is just my name, philipyancey.com, mm. one L and Philip, and then Y-A-N-C-E-Y. And then I have a, a Facebook site as well with a lot of posts. I only do a blog about once a week. I was working, or once a month rather, I was working on one this morning for Thanksgiving. And I know we're going to, you're going to be showing this after Thanksgiving, but um, philipyancey.com or philipyancey as the official Facebook page would be the best way to keep in touch. Excellent. 
and uh, as a Canadian, I would just say, regardless of the uh, the additional dollars, the the book is well <laughs> worth a purchase. So, yeah, pick up a copy of Where the Light Fell, uh, Philip. Hmm. You know, I I think I speak for maybe even millions of people in just saying, as a follower of Jesus, uh, your writing has profoundly shaped my life and hmm. deepened my appreciation and my understanding and even experience of God's grace in some very dramatic and formative ways and so personally i'm deeply grateful so thank you and i know for countless others they're also deeply grateful for you and your writing and for your story so thank you thank you for today and for everything you've shared it's been a great ride and to be able to work out my faith in public you know we all have these questions and i i get paid to wrestle with them all day long most people have full-time jobs that is my full-time jobs <laughs> Well, thank you so a, much. This has been a privilege. Okay. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.